Sorry, I'm, you're, it's recording. Go ahead. Okay, and we have people. Good evening, everyone. I'm Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. Thank you so all so very, very much for joining us for one of our HTC 50 lectures. Um, in the thick of it, our best war stories, how certain districts came to be. I'm going to just uh, briefly say, I hope that everyone knows what the Historic Districts Council is, but we are the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods. Um, we are 50 years old this year, so in uh, celebrating our 50th anniversary, we thought that we would talk and try to unearth parts of our history as well as examine parts of our present and even talk about parts of our future. HCC is uh, reasonably well known for helping other neighborhoods become historic districts, uh, gain landmark designation, as well as other ways of community support. In some cases, we're sometimes even referred to as, oh God, here come the landmark people. Um, but designation is, not, is only the beginning. Um, so much of what happens when you actually get designated as a uh, New York City historic district happens behind the scenes. It is a, a long process, and I was hoping that our speakers tonight would be able to explain and talk about um, their sort of journeys and their campaigns so we can all learn and share some stories. Um, in order of speaking tonight, uh, we have uh, Deborah Young. Deborah received a joint master's in social work and business and uh, social work and business from Columbia University and is a licensed social worker. In uh, 2001, Ms. Young, a native and lifelong Brooklynite and her late husband purchased a home in Brooklyn's Crown Heights North neighborhood and quickly became involved in the community co-founding the Crown Heights North Association, where she serves as board chairperson and president. China, CHNA, is the community's largest membership organization and has garnered numerous awards for organizations across the state and is responsible for securing landmark designation and national register listing for over 1,700 homes. Suzanne Spellen, long border of China, She's a rep both Crown Heights North and Bedford Stuyvesant for nearly 40 years, starting in the 1980s, and grew to preservation prominence as a columnist on architectural history for the prop popular Brownstoner website under her the pen name Montrose Morris. She now lives in Troy, New York, and is vice chair of the Troy Community Land Bank and has a seat on the Troy Planning Council. Lynn Massimo holds a degree in fine art photography from New York University and spent part of her early career as an architectural photographer served her in good stead in her work advocating for the designation of her neighborhood of Sunset Park, a project which has begun 20 years before, where she and her spouse bought a row house in 2003, was it, Lynn? 2001? Uh, 2000? 2000, 2000. 2001. And uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kressler has a doctorate in, art, in American history from the CUNY Grad Center and a Master of Library Science from Queens College. He's an associate professor at John Jay College and long a mainstay of preservation advocacy, especially in Queens, where he's been involved in almost every notable preservation campaign over the last 30 years. He'll be speaking specifically about the campaign to designate Sunnyside Gardens, where he now lives and his spouse has an architectural practice. So uh, I'm going, you're going to be hearing a lot from me. I do also apologize if I'm frozen because life is that sort of way now and in, in the world we find ourselves in. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to our speakers. Deborah. Hey, Deb, you click the unmute, or Michelle, can you unmute her? I'm sorry. <laughs> you got it. That would help. Um, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and I am happy to be able to share the Crown Heights North story and how we begin. You know, as I thought about this evening, I thought about it in terms of how it was not in my plans. It was nowhere in my bones to think of myself of being into preservation. All I knew was that I, my husband and I, found this house that we fell in love with. I did not know that my neighbor was going to be this passionate Denise Brown. And when we moved in, she was here. I think she had bought her house about a year before us. And we started talking, as neighbors do. And she would tell me about this community. She would tell me about um, 
this designation report that LP, um, that histor yes, LPC had prepared for various communities in Brooklyn and dated back to 1976. She didn't know why Crown Heights North did not proceed with the designation process as did other communities, but she was convinced that we should dust this report off, organize, and um, try to get something started so that this wonderful community could become de designated. So after countless hours of sitting on the stoop, having these conversations, sometimes with a glass of wine, um, and what we also would do is we would go to open houses. You know, every time Denise knew about an open house, she, she would say, let's go, let's go. So that kind of energized us. We dusted off the report. And then we started to recruit people as, you know, to organize the board. That is how we met Suzanne Spellin. We met her on an open house, um, which we never got into the house because the realtor never showed up. So we didn't have a, 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 a list of people that we could say, let's recruit them to become board members. It was just that if we saw somebody, they act like they were excited and was willing to do some work, come on in and join us. And that's really how we got started. Um, we reviewed the report. Um, we identified key stakeholders in the community. We identified our elected officials um, that we thought we could get some support from. We broke up into committees. Um, we had a public relations committee. We had a photography committee. We had a bylaws committee. And we just developed committees that we thought would be strategic in terms of us accomplishing our goal. After we did that, we then reached out to our elected officials and we had a series of meetings with them. And at that time, our key players was our current attorney general, Letitia James, and former council member, Al Van. And they rallied with us, they supported us, they helped us establish, open the doors with Landmark Preservation Commission and every time we asked them for something um, in terms of moving forward with designation, they were there to assist us. And that's how it began. We started um, reaching out to the community uh, members. We started holding meetings. Our meetings started out being educational because there were so many people who were not familiar with what it meant to be historically designated. There were many people who were opposed to the whole idea of somebody telling them what to do. Um, and they were just people that were not knowledgeable. Um, St. Gregory's um, opened up their doors to us because we don't have a building. We didn't have a building then. We don't have an office space now. We met in St. Gregory's Church. And there were um, events where we had up to 250 people in the community who came out to join us. So with the work of Suzanne, being a historian, um, Ethel Tyus, who um, is very active in the community and had lived here for long and who's our attorney, Denise Brown, her passion, me with my skills, and the other board members who joined us at that time, um, we organized and we moved forward. And I think that's our story in terms of how we began. Suzanne, do you want to jump in and add anything to that segment of it? Um, yeah, I'd like to say that one, the other elected officials that really helped us were Marty Markowitz because he was born in Crown Heights. He was born in Crown Heights South, but he was still said, I'm from Crown Heights. Yes. And he was very, very helpful and, and supportive. And we also were lucky that at the time we had Robert Tierney as the commissioner of the LPC. Uh, what turned out to be, I think he was appointed by Mayor Bloomberg just as, you know, another administrative person who didn't really have that much experience in what he was doing. He really, I think as he got uh, involved in, in being the chairperson of the LPC, got very excited about all the things that were happening. And he used to come to a lot of our meetings and he was just enthusiastic. And, you know, we, we had him, he, he loved us. So that was really helpful in terms of getting things done and getting landmarks. And um, 
I have some slides to show people uh, what kind of things we were getting landmarked. Let's see here. Let's see if this works. I have complete faith in you. Ah, these are just some of the blocks that, uh, oh, come on. There we go. This is just some of the architecture in our neighborhood. Uh, we've got wonderfully eclectic freestanding mansions, uh, row house blocks that span about 40 years of, of architectural styles. And um, these are two family houses on the left, apartment buildings, flats buildings, just all kinds of wonderful architecture that had been sitting around since the report from the 1976 report of uh, unprotected. And as the neighborhood got more and more gentrified uh, and more and more people from outside of the neighborhood were becoming interested in it, we knew that we had to get this protected or the developers would swoop in and a lot of this would end up getting torn down. Ooh, the Hebron school. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We can, we can come back to that one. <laughs> yes, yes. Suzanne, I wanted to add in um, that one, uh, during one of our early meetings with Landmark Preservation Commission, they had identified that the area was way too large for them to do the whole thing at one time. So what they did was they broke it up into four phases. And um, as we moved forward, um, 2000, uh, phase one was designated in 2007. And I think phase two was in 2011. And then phase three was 2015. Currently, we are gearing up to, and we, well, not gearing up, because we've already started working on phase four, um, which includes uh, Crow Hill. So I wanted to, to, you know, add that little piece in because it was um, a, a large area, as Suzanne referenced, with the number of buildings and that the landmark preservation was the one that divided it up. Another thing I think we should share with the group is that uh, landmark preservation mentioned that they didn't have the resources at that time. So we offered to help. I mean, we went out and did mass photo taking, although they had this the document, the report, some of the pictures were faded out. So what we did was we took pictures of the entire community so that they can have current photos that documented that little has had changed in terms of the architectural structure and the buildings that previously existed. So that worked to our benefit also when we tried to be as hopeful as we could to them so we they weren't able to lay back on well we don't have the resources we stepped up and did whatever we could to help move things along and we were greatly helped by historic districts council they about held that. our hand and and just led us through everything couldn't have done it without them you guys did all the hard work <laughs> And I think one of the great things about it is that working with HDC and just becoming a part of the greater New York preservation community, we've all met some really wonderful people who have become friends as well as colleagues in preservation. And, um, you know, it's a tight little world. And, and I think it's wonderful that when needed, a lot of people from other communities will come out and help and, and support. And, and uh, we've been able to support some other efforts of other groups. And it's really been really great in that respect. It's, it's also, we believe it's important to know, as I mentioned early on, that I had no knowledge about preservation. And I think that's what's important is that as you're trying to reach out or group to trying to organize themselves. Anyone who wants to work that has a skill, find a place for them. They don't necessarily have to be a historian and know about preservation, but if they have the passion and willing to work, you can't help but grow to love these, these buildings in our communities. So 
let everyone come in that wants to lend a hand and help you move your initiatives forward. I think that's a very important piece to hold on to. Thank you. And uh, there we go. Um, thank you. So uh, Lynn, do you want to take it away from there? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Um, a, a lot of what uh, Deb and Suzanne said is a lot of um, similar, sounded really, really familiar. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like to show you guys some slides and t tell you a little bit about Sunset Park. Give me one sec. All righty, so, um, so Sunset Park is in South Brooklyn and it's between Park Slope and um, Bay Ridge and it's a very diverse neighborhood with a legacy of immigrants, which is still continuing today. And Sunset Park is unique among Brownstone Brooklyn neighborhoods in that it was built for the working class, not built for wealthy. And um, the ha row houses were designed from the outside to look like one family, single family homes, but really on the inside, they were originally designed as two family homes with a top floor rental unit so that a working class family could afford to buy the house because they would have um, rental income and they could get a leg up into the middle class. But then <clears throat> around the mid 2000s, there was a really striking uptick in horrible things happening to the facades of the building. Really bad things started to happen. Really horrible things. Century-old street, streetscapes, they just changed in the blink of an eye, and they were forever destroyed. But then came the Sunset Park Land Marketing. And this is actually a picture of us after um, we did a lot of work, and um, this is at an upstate winery, so that's why we were all smiling. Um, but in uh, 2012, I spearheaded a grassroots campaign to get landmarked, but I, I had no idea what to do. I had no, never done anything in preservation. I didn't know anything about it. And this is where HDC came to the rescue. Um, and without HDC, I wouldn't be able to stand here and tell you that we successfully created four historic districts on 12 blocks, and that was over 500 houses. And it took seven years although the bulk of that campaign was in 2013 when we were in HTC six to celebrate and the HTC took us under their wing, like the baby birds that we were. And they gave us the framework of what to do in a campaign. And they answered all our questions and they were with us every step of the way. Uh, they gave us a lot of strategic guidance and tactical advice, a lot of phone calls, a lot of moral support and hand holding talking us off the ledge a lot of times. Um, and yeah, we would never, ever have been able to do this without them. So that's, um, that's my intro. Thanks. Um, and Dr. Kressler, tell us about. Well, our, uh, <laughs> our story is a little different uh, because the most in uh, pre preserving Sunnyside Gardens uh, were well aware of what historic preservation meant. And there was a long history of community involvement of trying to protect the community. Uh, and that had pretty much all fallen apart by about 2000. Uh, and in 2003, some neighbors came together to begin a press for uh, landmark designation. It was already protected as a special planned community preservation district, but not, I mean, not protected a specific plan, but it did not protect the architecture. Now, you had to convince your neighbors. Uh, you had to convince landmarks. Uh, what happened in Sunnyside Gardens was a little bit different. Let me uh, share my screen for a moment. Uh, 
just so you have a sense, uh, this is a, a plan of two of the blocks of Sunnyside Gardens. Uh, this would be our house right here. Uh, and what's charming and what was the intent of the plan was that you had a, a public face on the street. You had three family, two family, and one family homes, each of which had some connection to the garden out back. Every home had a private backyard. Now, uh, when we say private backyard, you envision an English garden sitting out with uh, wine coolers. Uh, at that, when they sold the houses, this was called the drying yard, and the City Housing Corporation actually put a uh, drying rack, one of those square uh, backyard drying contraptions where you could hang your laundry. That's what the backyard was for. Uh, but the interesting thing is that Sunnyside had uh, public spaces and they had private spaces, these backyards, and then it had neither public nor private. Uh, we have these common courtyards in, each, in the middle of each block. And these common courtyards were designed uh, to get a sense of neighborliness and community involvement. Uh, what had happened is they were protected for 40 years, and in the 1960s, the protections lapsed, and several people decided to put up fences. They would put up fences into the middle of the courtyard because really, this guy's property was all of this into the middle of the court. So they would just put up a fence one day and claim their backyard. This is an absolute horror. Uh, but the city created a special zoning district and that protected that aspect of it, but did not protect the architecture. And what you saw happening in uh, Sunset Park was what was threatened in Sunnyside Gardens. The odd thing is, uh, the fight in Sunnyside Gardens, this was built in the 1920s. It's one of the most historic communities in America. It's got an international reputation. Why isn't it a historic district? Uh, interestingly, it all, always attracted more or less intellectuals and professionals and writers and artists and that kind of population. What happened when we began the fight for preservation? There was a group who arose in opposition. And very soon, the question became not whether Sunnyside Gardens deserved to be designated as a historic district, but over the notion of historic preservation itself. They were very savvy academics, God help me. The leader was from the urban planning program at Hunter College, I swear, you can't make that up. And she, led an opposition group with ideas and, and also the usual fear-mongering, but it was against the very idea of preservation flying in the face of what Sunnyside Gardens was about. It was absolutely nonsense, but they were very sophisticated and the press loved it. The idea that this bucolic little community of little houses that people are like arming themselves to go after their neighbors tooth and claw. Uh, they, the press just thought that this was terrific, including uh, the, the New York Times. Uh, so what the Historic Districts Council had to do was not help us present the case to landmarks, but it had to have our backs and to fight in the press for the very idea of historic preservation. And remarkably, it was a very quick campaign. The uh, uh, neighbors came together in a preservation alliance in 2003, and we were designated just after uh, Crown Heights North in uh, the spring of 2007. So it was very quick, but it was a very heated time. And uh, HDC had to be in the press countering these nonsensical arguments. Uh, my wife and I bought 
our charming little house on 46th Street, right over here. We, had, we bought our house in 2004, just as this was getting underway. And uh, Laura was not accustomed to being a public figure. Me, I had been at Landmarks and I had a well-known mouth. Uh, but I explained to her that, yes, we had to get involved and she was willing, she's an architect. And I said, think of it like the Marines. We're the Marines landing on this beach of Sunnyside Gardens. Whenever the opponents talk about the landmarks law and what landmarking means, I can counter them because I've been doing this for decades and I know the law and I know the precedents better than they do. So they can't get away with it. And you are an architect. So every time they talk about the architecture not being insignificant, you have an architecture degree from Columbia and you can just swat them aside with your expertise. And I said, it's gonna be rough. We're gonna take casualties and we did. We took uh, personal abuse from people, but that was the idea. We, we felt like we were the Marines in the, in the trenches of this battle. And we were thrilled. The Landmarks Commission voted unanimously. It was easy as pie once it got to the Landmarks Commission but even the public hearing had like, it went on for hours and there were like 20 people speaking in opposition. I mean, there were 50 in favor, but all of this nonsense kept coming out. And in the end, the commission voted, oh yeah, it was a no brainer. Well, Jesus, we've been here taking hits for the last couple of years and you're, now you're telling us it was a no brainer? Thanks, Bob. Well, I did thank Bob actually. Um, and he ultimately was good about all this. But uh, that's our war story. Back to you, Simeon. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. Uh, one thing uh, that I've actually, that all three of you, I've got a question for, which is what, and you touched upon all of this, is just what sort of spurred the, um, your desires to get involved with your neighborhood? I mean, that's, it's, it's, as we all know, it's a, a, a long, it's a long road and a hard one, as Jeffrey was just saying. So, what specifically was um, was there a specific uh, building that did it? Was it the slow degradation? Uh, was it you know you wake up one morning and uh, something's going on? Well, I'll, I'll answer mine. Was actually one of my neighbors, who's a, a good friend. She just kept complaining. And every time I'd talk to her, she would just complain about it, you know, about the illegal conversions and, you know, how things also were starting to look so terrible. And she would say, I'm going to call the community board. I'm going to, and I'd be like, they're not going to be able to do anything. And I thought, I just need her to stop complaining. <laughs> Literally, that was the, my impetus was like I need her to stop complaining, and so no, and nobody was doing anything about it. And I thought, in order to stop the uh, changes that were happening, uh, we would need to be landmarked. And our council person at the time actually reached out to that other neighbor, the one who was complaining, and said, "Hey, do you know about the HTC?" Um, six to celebrate program um, because of course my neighbor had complained to the council person so, th so well, that's right it was Sarah Gonzalez wasn't that's it? That's right it was that's right and their office reached out and said hey how about you apply for this six to celebrate thing so I went around with my neighbor and we took a bunch of and we submitted it and we got selected and then I, I thought, thought to myself oh good god this means I'm gonna have to do it <laughs> <laughs> really, I I was both dreading it. I was both like so happy and proud that we had we had got been selected, and I was also terrified and dreading it. Anyway, that's our story of how it happened. <laughs> and Deb, I know that um, Denise sort of dragged you in and dragged you into yes. this. <laughs> she she did, and um, you know her passion. She don't. She just stayed at it, but walking around the community and starting to really take in the beauty of where I was living, that, that started setting in. But I think the straw that broke the camel's back that made me really say I'm in 
was there was a house when my husband and I first started looking. It was 1183 Bergen Street. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not the historian. Susan, you may know better about the house. I think it was an old colonial freestanding home. And we tried to get some information about that house because it just looked so attractive. It just looked like it was something that belonged in, in this c community and it looked historical and it was gone. It's gone? It was gone. It was torn down. <sighs> That's right. And what Denise called what it was placed, she called them the ginkgo houses that replaced it. And I think that is when I really, I didn't need Denise's passion alone. It was like, no, I don't want to see that happen to any other house in the community. But it was a, it was a, it was an awesome structure for me and losing that just, just spoke volumes. And I did not want to see that happen in this community. Yeah, they uh, tore that one down right before we got calendared. So they got in under the wire and it was a it was pink it was a pink right. shingled victorian house with oh a i have porch. a picture of that one yes <laughs> oh that was terrible for me, for me when i moved to bed in 83 i fell in love with just brownstone brooklyn um i used to just walk around and and pick out the buildings that I wanted. And um, I was never able to buy a house when I lived in Bed-Stuy, but I was able to buy one in Crown Heights. Um, a friend of mine who was a fireman owned about 10 or 12 different brownstones throughout Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. And he sold me the house that I bought in Crown Heights. And, you know, I, I was looking at the block. I looked and I started walking around Crown Heights more and fell in love with all the architecture. And that for me was what did it. And I just wanted to know more about all the buildings. I wanted to know more about the history. I learned about all the, you know, the actual technical terms of all the architectural features and the styles. And so I was in. Um, when I heard about Crown Heights North Association and landmarking, I was, you know, you, I, they were preaching to the choir. So it was just a, a natural extension to want to be part of the organization. And, and Deb, I, 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 I kind of recall, I think Bob Tierney told us HDC to look up Crown Heights North. I might be incorrect in that, but I think that you had spoken with him first and they called us and were like, you should talk to these folks in Crown Heights. I might be misremembering. You're muted, by the way. Um, Denise knew about uh, okay. Historic District Council, so it was through her. And okay. I'm negating that tyranny might not have also reached out because as Suzanne mentioned, he loved us. <laughs> well, you guys um, are so nice. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, but Denise said, no, we had to reach out to you because you were the ones that was going to help us along the way. So it might have been a twofold initiative of how we got involved with you. Thanks. Thankfully, we got involved with you. <laughs> we were all lucky. Jeffrey, was there actually a precipitating event that started Herb and that group on their quest to save Sunnyside Gardens? Or was it just a, hey, this is great and people are mucking it up? Yes and yes. It, it, there, there was no particular event, but there was the realization that the kind of protection that the community had was not enough and that it was entirely possible to, you could put Garden State brick face and stucco on the outside of your Sunnyside Gardens brick house and no one could say boo. You could rip out the windows and put in Palladian windows. You could do all of these horrible things and it was completely legal. Uh, all you needed was a buildings permit. Of course, this being Queens, most people did that without buildings permits, but that's just the way Queens is. Uh, so there were a couple of incidents, you know, windows being changed, uh, stone balustrade fences going up in the front yard, that kind of thing. and. It was just a realization that in a planned community where everything is built to the same style, once you start losing a few details here and there, the overall ensemble is lost. And it, it 
in a stripped down design language, every detail matters. And so there was that realization. Um, and as I said, it wasn't a matter of convincing so much as actually fighting the very concept of landmarking. I remember telling Bob Tierney at one event where I bumped into him and he couldn't avoid me. Uh, I said, Bob, it, I really fear that if Sunnyside Gardens is not designated, if these opponents succeed, then I, I fear for the fate of the landmarks law and future designations, because it would say you can torpedo a very valuable historic thing by uh, lies, misinformation. I mean, it, it, was, it was very ugly. I mean, they accused the pro-preservation people of being racist and anti-immigrant uh, and being essentially old white people who don't like change and don't like new people. Uh, what can you say to that? Except, no, no, I'm not really. I mean, it's, how, how do you win that? And, and I remember one of the things that we did um, and working with the community was going around to every single uh, council member with this uh, very diverse crowd of people and just sitting down and meeting with them and saying, these are all the people who live in Sunnyside Gardens who want landmarking. It, we, there were public meetings where someone would stand up and say, I'm an immigrant, I bought my house in Sunnyside Gardens and I want preservation. I mean, it, it was down to that kind of level at the community board meetings and Landmarks Commission meetings in Sunnyside. Uh, but they went door to door. Every house in Sunnyside, it, you could identify every house. It's a very limited uh, couple of blocks. Uh, every house got visited time and time again. And more than three quarters of the homeowners said, yes, I'm in favor. So it was always a minority in opposition, but that didn't seem to matter because in the press, you have both sides and it was very heated. Lynn, um, I know it took four years, uh, Seven. or longer. Seven. What, what, wait, four, wait, wait. what four years? Yeah. I'm sorry, you see, that's like, you know, I got right. Plus it took seven. Um, what was you know your biggest setback, do you think, at the, uh, because actually, I remember meeting with uh, the Landmarks Commission early on in, maybe in 2014 with them, 2015, and they were they were hot to go. Um, I think our biggest setback was when um, Menachi was um, was named as chair. Yeah, that was uh, all of our setbacks. Yeah, so that was the thing. Like, I, I think we were kind of on the path. And then, and that was it. It was sort of like, whoa, all of a sudden, everything just kind of came to a halt. Nothing, nothing happened. And um, we, we kept pressure up, uh, you know, throughout that time. But as soon as she was gone and Sarah Carroll mm -hmm. came in, it was literally like the floodgates opened. Sarah Carroll, I think, officially in October, of um, yeah, it was, I think it was, I, yeah, I think it was in Oct. No, no must, wait, have been, oh, must have been eighteen in Oct. 18, in, eighteen, yeah, yeah, and by January, like we were on the calendar. That that's how that's how fast it went afterwards. So that was our that was our biggest obstacle. Now you had a very different experience than. Deborah and Suzanne with regards to um, the segmenting of Sunnyside Gardens, of Sunset Park, forgive me. Um, can you sort of talk about how that happened? Because that was that was kind of odd. And especially, I don't know if Deborah and Suzanne know the story, and then they can tell the story, because they had mentioned earlier that they were going through the whole phasing process. Yeah, so we also had, it wasn't that ours was large. We had, um, we had several different areas that were worthy, but they to, they weren't all together. So there were separate areas that within themselves they were contiguous, but then there were many blocks in between before you got to the other area. So it was kind of like- was a, an archipelago. Yeah, there you go. And uh, 
so we advocated for all of those areas. <clears throat> we didn't think it would be possible to get all of them, um, but we didn't want phasing because things were happening so quickly, changing so quickly that if there was going to be phasing, then whatever ha would happen after the first phase, it would be gone. It wouldn't be worthy anymore. It would have gotten destroyed. So we kept, every time we met with the LPC, we kept advocating slash begging that they consider and think out of the box, consider doing multiple is at once, especially since the quantity of houses added up to the same amount that they, they say they could handle if they do an area at a time, right? Because they say they can right. handle like up to 800 houses. And we were like, well, this is under 800 houses if you do all of them, even though they're separate. Um, and then when they agreed, when they agreed to that and and they showed us their proposed map and it pretty much matched our map. Like my, just our jaws were on the floor and we couldn't even believe it. Couldn't wow. believe it. Now, um, did you have the problem? Um, Cause I, I know that this always is a problem in a lot of places of, well, the people who support the landmarking aren't necessarily the area that is being landmarked. So I know that Deborah and Suzanne Every time you went back, you'd have to show that the people in phase two want, you know, phase two to happen and people in phase three. Um, how do you, how do you sort of combat that, frankly, ridiculous statement? I think we were lucky that some of the people who were in the neighborhood that was in a phase were some of the loudest voices and some of the most, um, you know, aggressively campaigning people for the entire district. So, uh, like, I lived in phase one. Debbie lives in phase two. There was another uh, group of people who lived in phase three. Each phase was being considered. There was always at least one or two people who was very, who were very, very, um, for it and very gung-ho and, and did a lot of work. So that saved us. It wasn't like everybody who wanted landmarking lived in phase one and nobody else lived in any of the other phases. So I think that really helped. I think right there, yeah, adding to what Suzanne has already said, um, we weren't, because of how we structured ourselves, the focus wasn't just on a phase one or a phase two or phase three. It was on the community at large. So once uh, we started the process and people through our meetings um, got wind of what it meant and uh, to it, it wasn't any separation. Well, I'm in phase one. It was like, when are you going to get to us? Why is it taking so long? So they continuously came out and participated in our, we started calling them educational events. And we would always talk about what we were doing with the upcoming phases. So there wasn't that kind of separation as, as was already mentioned. Well, that's great. Um, and uh, I, I, everyone sort of talked about community meetings. Uh, does anyone have any sort of favorite or terrifying community meetings you want to share with with the with the crowd? <laughs> um, well, well, they were all kind of. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> we 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 had um, some naysayers um, that weren't in sport. They didn't want, you know, people telling them what to do with their houses. And I I don't remember if it was around the Elkins house before it became what it is today. Um, there was a threat of it being torn down in this building um, coming up that was going to upset the folks on that block. That same group of people who were yelling at our meetings that don't come here telling us what to do and all of this was the same people that turned around and said, how quick can we get it done? So I think that that was one of the memorable moments of when there was a significant shift. And I don't think after that group that we had people who were opposed to, to, to being designated. That's fantastic. We had uh, many meetings 
uh, the, the Landmarks Commission came out here three or four times for public meetings. And after we had been calendared, uh, Laura and I were wondering how can we dramatize the threat, the threat that you saw in uh, Sunset Park and Crown Heights that we weren't protected. And Laura came up with the idea of creating mock-ups, photo montages, showing what could be done legally to our little two-story brick houses. And uh, we printed up a bunch of these. And when we got, when the Landmarks Commission came, everyone's asking questions. And then uh, I asked, now, under the present law, uh, would these be allowed? And everyone is aghast at what these posters look like because they can't imagine anyone would have such horrible taste. Well, welcome to Queens. And so uh, I remember Sarah Carroll saying, um, yes, I, yes, they would seem to be legal. And I said, now, hypothetically, under a designation, would these kinds of changes be allowed? And Sarah went, uh, I I can't say, but I would certainly not think so. <laughs> that clear as to what the issue really was, uh, I think it turned some people so that it's not a horrible thing, it's a beneficial thing. Because the question really isn't what they prevent you from doing at your house, it's what it prevents your neighbor doing at their house because that's really the, uh, what you're concerned about. Lynn, any favorite uh, or horrifying public meetings? Um, well, meetings? <laughs> I, I, no, I wouldn't say there were any horrifying ones um, because we had lots of support. It was pretty miraculous how much support we had. So I think I would answer more in the what the favorite uh, meeting was when we did a presentation, well, not really so much a presentation, but when we went before the community board and um, we had over 120 people show up and they actually couldn't even fit into the building for the meeting. They were out on onto the sidewalk standing, waiting to come in, on the, in the standing in the rain. So uh, that was pretty remarkable. And then we got, um, uh, the people who spoke and gave testimony at that community board meeting, it was like a Benetton commercial of like a rainbow of, of people. And so it was, it was pretty amazing. I do remember during one of those Sunset Park meetings also, there was a little bit of concern about affordable housing and uh, people getting priced out. And I believe it was you who said, how many people in this room have oh, yeah. their homes? Yeah, so I think, yeah, that was the thing. Um, that we used to uh, talk about that a lot. Um, if you have, if you're an owner-occupied building, which is going to be more likely if you're landmarked, right? So I would ask at, at meetings, whenever that issue would come up, I would say, well, how many people here, you know, are, uh, you know, live in their building and have tenants, you know? And they're, like almost everybody would raise their hand. And I would say, how many people have ever, have you ever, you know, held, held the rent and not, not raised it because you knew your tenant was like going through a hard time with the work or something like that. And like lots of people would raise their hands, like, you know, and that they hadn't increased the rent. And, you know, um, and I even talked about um, um, one of our, uh, uh, one of our neighbors, he, he, he he at his own expense he built um, like one of those chairs that that rides up the top of the wall an, an, mm -hmm. an accessible chair when his um, tenant who lived on the top floor um, became sick and she couldn't walk anymore you know would a management company do that for you no it's amazing um, can uh, I just say something please. about uh, memorable things um, for me, one of the most memorable things was when we were testifying before the LPC and uh, they asked people from the community to 
who wanted to make a comment to come up. And we had these senior citizens who had bought their homes way back in the 40s and the 50s, back when Crown Heights was redlined and, and they had to have two or three jobs to, know, to be able to afford the houses. And they wanted to be landmarked more than anything. And, you know, some of the stories they told, you're just sitting there crying, you know, about how they purchased these homes way back then, 50 years ago, and they've raised their children, their grandchildren, and now they're going to pass it on to the next generation. And stuff like that was just so affecting. And, and how could you not landmark uh, a, a neighborhood with these kinds of people who who so desperately to the buildings when you know a lot of people thought that Crown Heights was part of the greatest hugest ghetto in in the America and all that kind of stuff. So it was just it was just so heartfelt and and wonderful to hear all that testimony. That's awesome. Um, I have a question here from Mitchell Grubler. Um, who is asking sort of, you know, uh, the sort of the post designation issue, which is, uh, do you have watchdog committees uh, for your neighbors? Like what happens after, uh, what happens after designation? And, and how has Landmarks, you know, there you are and you sell your community on, on, you know, going through this process and you spend years doing it. And is Landmarks, you know, actually holding up their end of the bargain with regards to violations? <laughs> yeah, Deb, you wanna... <laughs> well, you know, we don't have a watchdog committee, but we do have people in the community that will call Ethel or myself and say, <laughs> did you see what happened? You have to do something. <laughs> so um, it's usually Ethel or I who, if we don't get wind of it first, you know, ourselves, um, that will reach out to LPC to ask them, and you know, if something has come before them. Um, the other thing in terms of watchdogs and how we do, um, both Ethel and I are on the community board. Ethel is the chair of the Landmark Use, Land Use Committee. I'm a member of that. So when things come before LPC and they need a certificate of appropriateness, it does come to the community board and they are directed to reach out to us. And um, what we do is we review the plans and here we go again with HDC helping us out because we share those with Kelly and we look at those and see, um, you know, which direction if we're in favorable or something or we oppose, you know, to a project. So that's kind of how we keep our um, eye out on the community. I wish we did have a designated group and I wish we did have more people who would take it upon themselves to reach out to um, Landmark Preservation Commission, but we don't, so we do the best we can, but keeping our eye on the community and that things that's not supposed to happen don't happen. And that, and your community board is really great and you've really worked really hard, um, hard to invigorate um, that community board getting involved with Landmarks issues, because it just wasn't before you, you all were involved. Oh, okay. It's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> in, uh, in Sunnyside, it's, uh, it's an, from my perspective, it's an unhappy story because all of the neighbors who were brought together in the Preservation Alliance, once it was designated, it was almost as if their job was done. And uh, when I would inform them, the, the Landmarks Commission wouldn't respond to just this person or that person, but if the Preservation Alliance brought something to their attention, that had some heft, but they absolutely have refused to get involved in regulation. And so now you have this community void of not actively monitoring. Uh, questionable things have happened. They never come and testify about legalizations, and it's usually legalizations of violations. Um, so that's been a real disappointment. And I have to say that the Landmarks Commission also has been something of a disappointment because we have a very simple design vocabulary. The, the kit of parts in Sunnyside Gardens is brick, slate, 
wood, wood uh, uh, windows, that's it. You know, it's not this exotic, eclectic landscape. Uh, but the Landmarks Commission in, reg in regulating Sunnyside Gardens approaches every application as if it's this new world and what are they asking for as if there are no precedents and they uh the, the the key i mean at one point they approved a a horrible door that had been done illegally uh with a storm door a white aluminum storm door i their their justification was uh that well it's so far from the street so i wrote to the chair and said uh i'm really disappointed what message does this send to homeowners who do the right thing if they can get away with junk and just for the record the door in question is exactly 12 feet from the public sidewalk uh but you know so what uh so it's it's been rather more difficult than it has ha than it had to be because the landmarks commission really doesn't have our back in regulating to a very strict standard in Sunnyside. And they've allowed legalizations of some really horrible stuff. Mm. But other than that, I like Sarah, she's great. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, you're actually, you know, you, you're, you still have a car smell Where on your you uh, historic district. <laughs> what did you um, But have, you know, have you seen things I don't I don't really think we've even seen a few many things come up through certificate of appropriateness yet no I, I think you know we're we're pretty new uh, yeah. the designation was a, a year ago in June um, and then well so it's been about 12 months and and a couple of those months we've ha been having a pandemic right. so um, yeah I don't think much has happened happening one one way or the other. I, I, I haven't seen any horrible things. Um, I haven't been notified of any horrible things happening. Um, and I, I agree with you. I, I doubt there have been very many um, uh, certificate of appropriateness even being filed. Mm -hmm. Also, because people probably don't even really understand they need to do that yet. I think there was a, <clears throat> you know, a big sigh of relief that we got landmarks, but then, you know, people needing to know what they have to do, uh, the paperwork and the stuff that they have to do. I, I don't think that that, we, we haven't done a good job yet with getting people to, to know and understand what, what that's all about. Well, that's, as, 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 that's, you know, my excuse. I'd like to add something. Please. Uh, when it, you know, we talk about setbacks uh, in particular, um, and I think it was already said, uh, mentioned tyranny not being there was a setback. But beyond that, I think about uh, the political atmosphere mm -hmm. it has changed significantly from when we started to where we are, where we are now. Um, there are so many different competing demands, um, competing interests, and that do not lend themselves to preserving our communities. So whereas we had the Tish James and the Al Vans where we could get to, too often um, we are not able to get to our elected officials to support our um, efforts as we used to be. Um, ties in with gentrification, um, it, it ties in with wanting to build affordable housing and the misunderstanding about what affordable housing means and you can't have designation and affordable housing. And so there's been, there was a, there's a significant shift that it has occurred over the years that's moved us away from getting the kind of support um, around designation than we had previously. Which is, which is curious. Cause I mean, I know for example, um, your neighboring council member, uh, council member Cornegie, who I think actually represents part of your neighborhood too. Yes. Um, he was actually kind of involved in the bed in in preservation efforts in bed but he has not been particularly receptive as a council person since gaining office. And uh, and Jeffrey, you know, Jimmy Van Bramer was actually helpful there, you know, Jimmy during... Jimmy Van Bramer was very helpful when he was just Jimmy Van Bramer, the guy who lives across the street from me. 
Jamie Van Bramer, council member, has been a disaster. He has not stood up for any preservation fight whatsoever. And he hasn't given money to any preservation cause out of his, you know, bucket of money. He is, he's just a Queens guy. And it, I don't, I mean that in the worst kind of way. I'm a Queens guy too. And I mean that in the best kind of way. Uh, I'm no, glad he, that you've defined your, your, your different parameters yeah. there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very difficult when you don't have a, a council member or the political establishment on your side because uh, they make things easier. They can make things happen. And uh, in our situation, it's just a vacuum. But it's funny, for example, like with Lynn, actually her, the initial council person, Ms. Gonzalez, who you know, was an old Brooklyn council person was very in favor of this and then she got replaced by a very progressive uh carlos yeah and, yeah talk about that well building that, um, relationship. Th th that was actually one of the things that we thought was going to be a big setback it ultimately it turned out it wasn't but it it took a lot of work it, it took a lot of help from the hdc giving us advice on the care and feeding of our council <laughs> Um, and ultimately, we did win him over um, a big time, you know, and he's, you know, fully in support. But for a very long time, he w it's not that he was ever saying he was opposed, but he just would never say he was in support. It took a long time. And a lot of it was, was that we had to build um, the support of other organizations that carried a lot of weight in the community because he was listening for that, you know. He wanted to make sure um, everyone was on board and we were able to get everyone on board. And so that finally, you know, I think is what swayed him. Yeah. And I mean, he was, he was great and he showed up at uh, the meetings with, with Minakshi and eventually, and was a great champion um, at yeah. council. So, yeah. Um, we promised that we would let you all off the hook after seven, but it, it, anything that, you know, you'd like to address that it hasn't come up, please, you know, uh, or also alternately people in the audience, if there's any additional questions, do please put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A. I think one of the things that we're dealing with in Crown Heights North now are uh, entities and developers who want to push the envelope. Uh, we've got two big projects that were in our, our um, one in phase one and one in phase two, where um, we had these historic buildings, these historic sites that developers, the owners of the buildings wanted to build uh, huge extensions, huge um, apartment buildings that wrapped around the buildings and or sit beside them on landmark properties. and in one case with the Dean Sage House, which is just across the street from the Children's Museum on Brooklyn and St. Mark's, we had to sue. We had to sue the, the city in order to stop a development on a landmarked property. And um, there's another case coming up with the Hebron School that you pointed out when I was showing the slides. A developer, well, the people who own the school uh, want to sell the back lot and have an eight-story apartment, well now it's six, six-story apartment building that stretches from one end of the lot to the other. And uh, this is on a landmark property. And you would think that the landmarks law would be strict enough and clearly written enough so that no one would even attempt to try to do something like that. But, you know, Crown Heights North is now really hot and um, you know they're they're sniffing around and they see big bucks so it, it's really I think uh, the next few years especially in Brooklyn and probably in Queens and everywhere else where every single square inch of property is valuable that we're going to see a lot of pushback and uh, hopefully these cases will will determine whether or not you can just do whatever you want no matter whether it's landmarked or not yeah 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 adding to what suzanne has said um 
uh, we have uh, the person who they hired to push this project forward is a lobbyist. And also interesting is that one of the commissioners, Ed, Ed, Ed Verado, or was the last one? Yes, thank you. Um, was the architect behind the proposed building. And he's now a commissioner. Yeah. So we have a battle here. It's gonna be interesting. The other, you know, if is there a word for aesthetics? I mean, if the buildings weren't so bad, we might not mat we might might not, you know, matter to us. But the buildings are almost always so bad that they want to propose. It's like the architects stopped after, you know, studio first year when they come up with these horrible buildings. They're they're not urbanistic. They don't engage the street. Just how units can you cram in there? And you know, give us something better. And sure, you can build, build as of right, but give us a good design that fits into the community. And in recent years, we're seeing less and less of that. And I fear that the commission is like pressured to accept a lower standard. Well, it's, you know, um, it, it is a, they are a reactive agency at the end of the day. And the people who are driving new development are the people who have vested interests in it. Well, that's an upbeat sort of ending, <laughs> now, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Sorry, I go dark sometimes. Okay. Um, thank you all very, very much for spending some time with us. Thank you, everybody in the audience. We'd also like to thank our co-sponsors at um, the uh, General Society of Tradesmen, uh, Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York for their help. Originally, we were supposed to be in the space for this event, and we look forward to returning to that space again. Um, thank you all. Wait, I see someone in the chat. And thank you, Deborah. And so, um, thank you. And uh, everyone stay safe and be well. And, um, you know, hopefully we will see each other soon in person. Okay, Thanks. take care, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice. This was great. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.